Dear friends, thanks again for joining me today. Um, so wonderful to see you all. And thank you for your kind comments. Uh, I got so many comments from you and questions. Today, we are going to talk about Islam. You know, we've talked about Buddhism. Uh, we talked about Hinduism. And today, I would like to talk a little bit about where Islam came from and how it relates to Judaism and Christianity because today we again find ourselves in a holy war. You would think that holy wars were sort of the stuff you read about in, in history books. You know, in the Middle Ages, that's when we fought about religion. Here we are in the 21st century and again we're fighting a holy war. Very, very strange. Where did that come from? Today I would like to talk about the genesis of Islam and how it relates to Judaism and Christianity, and specifically about the caliphate, or the caliphate, uh, which these crazies called ISIS want to recreate. Well, I have some news for them, so I hope they're watching, because the caliphate was not at all the, uh, the place, the society that they are trying to create in Syria and Iraq right now. It was a time of great tolerance for very good reasons as we shall see. So, and at this, tomorrow then we'll talk, uh, I'm sorry, on, on the last C day, we'll talk a little bit about today's world. Um, where do these tensions come from? Well, what can we do about it? So, uh, the genesis of, of, of Islam, Judaism, Christianity is an incredibly fascinating subject. And it, it, it's the topic of this book uh, from Moses to Muhammad, which I wrote uh, almost 10 years ago and has since been translated in languages. It's now in its second print. Even Apple was kind enough to produce a multimedia edition. So if you have an iPad or a Samsung uh, through Apple iBooks, you can get the multimedia version of this book, which has lots of videos and interactive maps and stuff like that. Thank you, Apple. It's one of the first uh, multimedia e-books of its kind. Uh, and to start the story, I have to take you back to 6th century Arabia. And 6th century Arabia was located between two very large superpowers. Here's my little pointer. On the one hand, we had the Persian Empire which was the heir to the Parthian Empire. The Parthians were the nemesis of Rome. Rome tried to subdue them time and again, could not subdue them. Very, very strong, powerful empire. And on the other hand, we had the Byzantine Empire. Now, the Byzantine Empire is just a fancy name for the late Roman Empire. Now, ever since the Emperor Theodosius II in the late 4th century, decided to make Christianity the only religion of Rome, of the Roman Empire. From that point on, we talk about the Roman Empire as the Byzantine Empire. I mean, life went on. Emperors came and went. Taxes were collected. Wars were fought. But now the Roman Empire was solely a Christian Byzantine Orthodox, or what we would later call Greek Orthodox, empire. It was not Constantine the Great who did that. A lot of people believe it was Constantine the Great. Constantine the Great merely allowed Christianity to flourish as a tolerated religion, a religio licita, a licensed religion. Constantine the Great, in fact, continued to be the high priest of the Roman cult. And legend tells us that he was only baptized on his deathbed. It was Theodosius, some 50 years later, who really made Christianity the only religion of the Roman. And then you see a lot of bad things happening. Roman temples are destroyed. People, the mob rushes in, steals all the silver and the gold. Sculptures are knocked down. Terrible time. And uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. Now, the Byzantine Empire and the Persian Empire were always at each other's loggerheads. There was always tension there. So pre-Islamic Arabia was sort of divorced from that. In pre-Islamic Arabia, there were two major constituencies and two 
other sort of foreign elements. First of all, there were the settled Arab tribes. Yesterday we talked about settlements, the idea that people come together, settle, usually near an oasis, a source of water, and devote themselves to dry farming to the extent that you could do that in Saudi Arabia uh, or, or uh, other domestication. And then there were the nomadic Bedouin, Al-Badiya. And the Al-Badiya were always moving from one pasture to the next for their herds. And you see it also in Hebrew scripture, there was constant tension between the settled tribes and the nomadic tribes. Even to this day in Sinai, there is, there is tension over resources, over water, over the natural resources. Now, there were two other very important elements in Arabia at the time. One were the Jewish trading communities, Jewish diaspora communities throughout the Mediterranean Arabia were typically the ones who gave credit. So if you wanted to organize a caravan, which was a nine-month proposition easily, you needed credit to finance that. Jewish trading communities were typically the ones that you went to for credit. And finally, there were many Christian dissident commu communities. Now, what are those? Over time, by the end of the fourth century, Theodosius II and emperors after them defined an exact specific orthodoxy in Christianity, and many people didn't agree with that. For example, Arianism. It all came down to who was Jesus? Was he a god? Was he a man? To what extent was he of the divine substance? To what extent was he bigger or smaller than God? It came to be a very metaphysical discussion. And there were many, many groups of people, Christians, who did not agree with the so-called Nicene Creed. For those of you who are Catholics, you will remember the Nicene Creed. It's still read every Sunday. That creed says that Jesus is consubstantial with the Father, of the same divine substance as the Father. That's the Nicene Creed, which Constantine the Great supervised. That creed was not adhered to by many other people, such as the Monophysites and the Arianites and the Nestorites. I'm not going to talk about what all these people mean, but these communities were forced out of the Byzantine Empire and would set up their monasteries on the periphery just across the border in Arabia. What, just to be alone, to be in solitude? Yes, to reflect on Christ and God in, in the solitude of the desert, but at the same time, to cater to the needs of the caravan trade. Now, that's very important because uh, Mecca and to some extent Medina up here were not on the main caravan routes from Oman, frankincense, remember, all the way to the major uh, depot cities up here, such as Petra. Uh, but there was a tributary which ran along the coast, and along the way they picked up some myrrh from down south in Yemen. So there was definitely a caravan link that ran through, through Mecca. Now, it's important to remember that Arabia at this time was a pagan nation, which means they worshipped many different gods. The super god, the Zeus, the Jupiter of this pre-Islamic uh, Arabian pantheon was a god called Allah. Huh? Wait a minute. Allah? Yes. Allah was a known god, but he was not the only god. There were many other gods that these uh, Arabs worshipped. Idols like Hubal, uh, even uh, Allah had had daughters, the moon goddess, the goddess of fortune, the goddess of Venus, of love. And then there were jinns, spirits, very much like the animism that we saw in India. Spirits that could hide under a rock or in a tree or an oasis. A whole world full of strange spirits. And the other thing you have to understand is that Arabia was not a homogenous nation. It was a large, large territory of warring tribes. These people were always at each other's throat. Constant warfare between various tribes over water, over access, over herds, you know, you name it. Uh, maybe somebody had insulted someone. 
These, 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 these fights could go on for, for many, many years. And that was the major curse. And Muhammad knew that. Muhammad knew that Arabia could never fulfill its manifest destiny unless something could unify the Arabian Peninsula along around a bigger idea, just as Rome had organized itself around the Christian idea, and just as Persia had organized itself around Zoroastrianism. And so Muhammad was really ripe for an idea such as. Now, I'm sure you've seen this thing on television, right? It's the Kaaba. Nobody knows where it comes from. At the time, we're talking the time of Muhammad, it was a shrine devoted to all kinds of idols. Allah and Hubal and the local gods and bigger gods and smaller gods. The place inside was packed with, with idols, similar to the one I just showed you. That is, uh, that is one of the rare, rare sculptures. Um, uh, I photographed this in the Louvre in Paris. One of the very rare sculptures we have of a deity before Islam, because obviously when Islam came, all of these idols were destroyed. They were all destroyed, but this is one of the few that has survived. So the Kaaba was a shrine for paganism, and get what? Even though everybody was always fighting, once a year they would call a truce, and during that truce everybody would come over to Mecca, on pilgrimage and they would worship these gods in this square block and they would walk around the shrine seven times does that sound familiar <laughs> yes these are pagan practices which Muhammad later on absorbed into Islam because it was such an ingrained part of Islamic uh, of, of Arabian culture similar to the way for example the way Christians have taken on the winter solstice celebration, which was a very pagan Roman celebration where you took a tree and you put candles on it and you gave each other presents. That is a Roman pagan celebration which early Christianity absorbed into Christian rites as Christmas because nobody was going to give that up. I mean, they would become a Christian, but we're not going to give up, you know, the winter solstice celebration. So in many ways, these traditions are absorbed. Now, Muhammad, the prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, was an orphan. He came from a tribe called the Quraysh, which was uh, not a very wealthy tribe. And he was orphaned at a very early age, very sad. I mean, as a young boy, he had lost both his father and his mother. And then he was raised by his uncle, and he died. And then he was raised by his grandfather. And, and orphans, being an orphan, creates a very special psychological context. In my book, I talk similarly about the fact that Jesus uh, may have been raised as a mamzer because his paternity was in doubt. And for a young child, it's very difficult because you become ostracized in your village community. And Muhammad then was lucky. He married a very wealthy widow because he was a smart man. Khadijah uh, was very wealthy. She, uh, he, she had hired Muhammad to organize her caravan trade, and the two came close, fell in love, and then as Khadijah's husband, he became in charge of all the major caravans, of many of them at least, that Khadijah would fund to bring the spices and the frankincense and all the things we talked about up to the great uh, cities uh, where these were dispatched on through the Roman Empire. So. Our assumption is, and this is an assumption which Islamic scholars take issue with, the assumption is that along the way, Muhammad came in touch with both Jewish and Christians at the monasteries and because of the trade context, because otherwise it is very difficult to understand why Muhammad would know the biblical characters that would so shortly be revealed to him in the revelations. I mean, if you talk to someone about Noah, or Abraham, Ibrahim, or Jesus, Isa. Uh, these, these terms, they must mean something. Because otherwise, Muhammad would have said, well, I don't know who these people are. 
What, what did they mean to me? So the fact that Muhammad, when he started to receive his revelations, understood what God was telling him about these biblical characters, to me must mean that he was to some extent exposed to these things. So indeed in 610, the famous year, Muhammad was in a cave where he often went to meditate. And there, as we are told in his biography and in the Quran, the angel Gabriel, the angel Gabriel, same as who appeared to Mary as part of the Annunciation, appeared to Muhammad and said, recite in the name of your Lord who created. He created man from a cloth, from a blood cloth. Recite for your Lord is most honorable. These are the very first, we think, the very first words spoken in Revelation to Muhammad. And from there came a whole series of revelations which basically ordered Muhammad to abandon what he was doing to become a prophet for a new monotheism, a Arab version of Judeo-Christianity, uh, which would unify the Arab tribes, prompt him to abandon this silly paganism, and, and basically marshals themselves around the idea of a single God, very much like Judeo-Christianity. In fact, uh, in the early years, Muhammad would write to the Jewish community in Medina and say, Yatrib, as it was called then, and say, since we're all basically the same, since my new faith that I've been told to propagate is essentially an Arab version of Judaism, let's all get together, let's all be unified. And the Jewish community in Medina said, thanks very much, but we have our Razul, our prophet, and his name is Moses. Then he wrote to the great um, uh, king in the Byzantine era, uh, empire, and said, how about Christianity and Islam make common cause? And the emperor said, no thanks. We have our, our leader and his name is Jesus. And that sort of discouraged Muhammad. And from that point on, you see uh, that early Islam taking a more Arab overtone. So in 622, Muhammad ostracized by Mecca. Nobody in Mecca wanted to hear about a single god and a new religion because it threatened the business that they had every year with the pilgrims coming to the Kaaba. So he left for Yatrib, a city called Medina, and where he became the leader, the mayor, the head, the statesman. And from that point on, you see that the revelations become a lot more complex, a lot more political, more, more statesmanlike. And this trip from Mecca to the refuge in Yatrib or Medina is the famous Hijra. The Hijra marks the beginning of Islam. And so the Quran is basically a recording of all these revelations, these, uh, these individual revelations that Muhammad received first from the angel Gabriel, then when he became more experienced, it was a direct communication, we are told, from God to Muhammad. And so these, these individual surahs were not written down for a long time, similar perhaps to the way the, the sayings of Jesus were not written down, we think, for many, many decades. They circulated as oral traditions and were not written down for the first time until some 30 years after the crucifixion event by Mark, the first gospel. Similarly, these, the, the oral, the, the, these, these revelations circulated among the immediate community of Muhammad, his companions, his helpers, and they were able to recite them from heart. That, in fact, is the meaning of the word Quran. It goes back to the Arab verb Qur'a, which means to memorize and recite. Memorize and recite. So for many, many years, these revelations really circulated just in an oral form. And, and when finally, many, many years after the death of Muhammad, Udman decided to say, you know, we gotta, we gotta create a canon. We gotta pull all these things together, similar to the way the canon of Hebrew scripture was finally organized. Uh, people started to look, well, well, what do we have? There were some people who could recite the whole Quran from start to finish. But where was the beginning? Where was the end? And so they made the rather strange decision to organize the Quran by length. 
So when you read the Quran, you, f you, you begin with the very long surahs, which are actually the most recent ones, and the oldest or the shortest ones are all the way uh, at the end. So you read the Quran chronologically backwards, but it's, it doesn't really matter because unlike the Bible, this is not a continuous story. These are individual sermons, sermons spoken by God in the first name to Muhammad. And then Muhammad basically, the Quran basically says that the, 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 the founder of Islam, that Islam really traces its line back to Abraham. Hey, wait a minute. Abraham, Abraham, that's the Judeo-Christian prophet. Why would Muhammad trace the origins of Islam to our Abraham? <laughs> right? He's ours, not yours. And in fact, Islam goes as far and says, well, just as the Judeo and Christian tradition traces its line from Abraham through Isaac, we trace our line from Abraham through Ishmael, Ishmael. Well, that's total nonsense, one might say, except for one very intriguing point, because the information that, that uh, Muhammad and, and Islam base itself on is actually... In Genesis, you don't believe me, I'll show you. In Genesis it says that uh, Abraham's wife Sarah was barren, remember that? And so Abraham lay with an Egyptian slave, Egyptian, uh, Hagar, who gave as a surrogate mother, and they had a son called Ishmael, El Shama, God hears me. And then finally, Sarah had a child herself, that child is... Yishak, he who laughs, Isaac. And now, of course, there is a problem. Which of the two sons will inherit the birthright? Well, Hebrew scripture says it's obviously Isaac because he is the true son of Abraham and Sarah. But Genesis also says something else because Sarah then says, Out with that woman! I have my own son now. I don't want any competition. Get her out. And Abraham does. He sends them into the desert, Hagar and Ishmael, and then an angel comes and says, come lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make a great nation. The same thing that the angel promised to Isaac. I will make you a great nation. The same thing is said to Ishmael, and then further along, Ishmael becomes the father of Arab tribes. It says it right there in Genesis. So the origins of Islam, believe it or not, are in the Hebrew scripture, are in the Jewish Bible, where it says, he shall be the head of many Arab tribes. And these names that you see there are still current. In the works of the first century uh, historian Josephus, we see many of those same terms appear. Uh, so we know that in the time before Muhammad, Arab tribes, pagans though they may have been, knew that, for, that to some extent they all came from this Ur father named Abraham or, or Ibrahim. Well, this is how it developed. And in fact, then we're told by the Quran that whereas Hagar and Ishmael went to Paran, and from that point on, Genesis basically abandons the story. The Quran says, oh no, Abraham took Hagar and Ishmael all the way down to Mecca. And there, Ishmael and Abraham together built the Kaaba. So now in the Islamic view, the Kaaba is really the work of Abraham. And in the intervening years, lots of pagan gods have intervened and messed things up. But it falls, therefore, on Abraham to get rid of all that paganism and to restore, to restore the Kaaba to the worship of one God, Allah. And there you have it, folks. That is Islam in, in very, very brief terms. So uh, once he'd done that, um, Muhammad died in 632. Arabia was, was all unified in the Islamic uh, faith. And then something very sad happens. For the first 
years after Islam embarked on its great conquest, and the reason why it had to embark on its conquest is because many of the warring tribes that had pledged their support of Muhammad abandoned their support after Muhammad died. So uh, Uthman and all these other uh, Umar, all these other great sultans, they had to fight a war to keep Arabia unified. That war spilled over into Persia, into the Byzantine Empire, and from there it couldn't be stopped. It raced on, and in just mere decades, the great sultans of the early Islamic Empire created a realm larger than any other realm that had existed before. A realm that stretched from Spain all the way to the Persian Gulf. A stupendous achievement made possible by the fact that both Byzantine, or the Byzantine Emperor and the Persian Emperor had so fought each other to a standstill that their armies were exhausted. But now something truly astonishing happened because Muhammad had never specified the succession. Like many great rulers, he thought he would live forever. You know, it's a, it's a natural instinct. Oh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll worry about my succession, you know, when the time comes. Look at some of our big corporations, you know. Uh, they, they struggle with the succession. Disney, for example, it's a, it's a great example. Men who are in full command of their destiny don't want to think about death and what comes after that. And so, in the case of Muhammad, who was a superb organizer, he never specified the succession. So there were the four righteously guided caliphs, but after the last one, Uthman was assassinated, riots broke out, and then there was a split. That old rivalry between Mecca and Medina emerged, and there was a group in Mecca who clamored for people from their tradition like Abu Bakr, the middle class. And they were called Al-Sunnah Wal-Jama, followers of the traditions, the Sunnah of the Prophet, and they're the Sunnis. And then there was another group located in Medina, and they said, no, we think that the successor should come from the line of Muhammad's own son-in-law and his cousin named Ali. And they are called the followers of Ali, or Shiat Ali. There you have it, folks. There is the famous split between Sunnis and Shia. It all revolved around the succession. And of course, in the century since, Shia and Sunni became very different in their rights, in their focus, in their doctrine, in their culture. Very similar to the way Catholicism and Protestantism went separate ways for a very simple reason. But over time, of course, they became culturally very different. And that is where the origins of the Sunnis and the Shiites are. Now, after Ali was assassinated, the Umayyad dynasty, I promised I'd tell you a little bit about the Umayyads, was took over. And the Umayyad dynasty introduced a great flowering of culture as well as tolerance. And this is my key point. In the early caliphate, Jews and Christians were respected as people of the book, people who had received the same revelations from God that Muhammad had. Of course, Islam will say right away, well, you know, their Bible is not, not very correct. There are distortions. There are misinterpretations. The revelations are the same, but clearly the Jews and the Christians did not quite get what God was talking about. It was left up to Muhammad in the Quran to really state those stories and messages very, very clearly. But clearly, in a world that was still largely pagan, Jews and Christians were allies for early Islam. Don't forget, unlike today's world, where much of the world is monotheistic, back then, the common enemy was paganism. And so Islam naturally was drawn towards Jews and Christians because together they all shared that solidarity as monotheists. And so you see this tremendous empire emerging, much of this still Christian. Huh? You have Coptic Egypt here, you have Spain, which is Visigoth, Aryan is Christian, all this massive territory. And so the Umayyads cultivated this tolerance because they needed the Jewish and the Christian 
businessmen and leaders and caterers and bureaucrats, people who spoke the language, who knew the territory, they couldn't govern this vast empire by themselves. They needed Jewish and Christian allies to govern it with them. And that's why the caliphate was a time of great tolerance. Yes, there was tension. Obviously, there was tension. Non-Muslims were required to pay a much higher tax. But other than that, there was no cutting off of heads. There was no burning in cages. All of this, this, this nonsense that ISIS is engaging in, if they want to recreate the caliphate, this is their model. This should be their model, a model of great tolerance. And in fact, uh, the Bible says it very, the Quran says it very clearly. We gave Abraham's children, Jews and Christians, the book of the wisdom. We have given them a grand kingdom. So the Quran is replete with references to Judaism and Christianity. In fact, when you read the Quran, you'll be astonished. It's 65% is the Bible. Uh, Adam and Hawa, Kabil and Habil, Nu, Ibrahim, Musa, Dawood and Sulaiman, Isa, Jesus, Miriam, Mary. There are more references to Mary, mother of the Messiah, in the Quran than in all the Gospels combined. Did you know that? It's astonishing, isn't it? Now, I'm, I'm watching my time here, but I want to show you one quick video because my book, Moses to Muhammad, became a film. And what we did in that film is we tried to demonstrate the many things the Quran and the Bible have in common by taking two narrators. I'm just going to show you one clip, and now we're going to go to Abu Dhabi. Uh, and what we did is we have two narrators. They tell the story of the Annunciation. And one narrator speaks the Bible, and the Luke, Gospel of Luke, in this case, and the other narrator says the Quran. And watch the tremendous similarity and how Quran and Gospel really go hand in hand. Here we go. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man named Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came into her and said, O Mary, verily God has chosen thee above all the women of the world. Truly, God gives you glad tidings of a word from him. Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son. His name shall be the Messiah, Jesus, the son of Mary, and regarded in this world and the next with those whose place is near to God. He shall be great, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered, This is the Lord's will. Nothing is difficult for him. The Lord has said, He shall be a sign for mankind and a blessing from us. Well, it's, it's a little hard to imagine, but until um, I wrote that book, nobody had ever done that. Nobody had ever put these stories side by side and compared them. And so Moses to Muhammad is, is the first thing to do that. And the reason why I speak about this topic a lot all over the world is because this is what we need to realize. There's a lot that sets us apart, but there's a lot more that we have in common. And it's those things that we have in common uh, such as between Judaism and Islam, the fact that both abstain from pork, that both eat kosher food, that both practice circumcision, uh, that an imam and a rabbi basically form the same type of function in society, and similarly in Christianity, that both practice fasting, that both care about the poor, that both share the concept of afterlife and the judgment day. According to the hadith, the writings, guess who heralds in Islam, the coming of last judgment. Muhammad, you say? No, it's Jesus. According to Islam, it is Jesus who comes to herald the last judgment. So they're, they're, they're tremendous. I don't have quite time to 
delve into it a little bit more deeper, but what I just want to give you in this very short overview is the sense of tremendous, tremendous consonants. And so we must start to emphasize these things that we have in common in order to get out of this rut with Islamofascism and Islamic terrorism. The mosque, similarly, is not a dwelling place of God. You will see many mosques. It is a, something like a Jewish synagogue. It's a communal hall for prayer, but also a communal hall in times of distress or for civic functions. The physical presence of Allah is not there as in a church, but it is a sacred place for reflection and, and prayer. Men are separated from women, as in a synagogue, and always look for the nihrab. The nihrab is the prayer niche, which shows you the direction of Mecca when people turn towards Mecca towards prayer, as I'm sure you know. So I hope I've given you a little bit of an overview of early Islam and what we can expect in Abu Dhabi. Join me again for my last lecture on Sunday, the sights and sounds of Dubai. Thank you very much. Thank you.